And we want to uh, welcome everyone here to uh, the webinar today uh, with Nate Polzin and Ryan Brock. And this webinar is Brethren Distinctives and Church Planting. This is a webinar that is produced by Discipleship Ministries of the Church of the Brethren with the New Church Advisory Committee. And so we're delighted that everyone can uh, connect uh, to this webinar wherever you're joining us from and uh, hope that uh, you'll have uh, numerous uh, takeaways that you can uh, take back to your congregation and share with others. So uh, many of you know uh, Nate and Ryan. Uh, Nate is uh, a former DE and also the pa uh, pastor, founding pastor of the Church and Drive in Saginaw, Michigan. Ryan is the founding pastor, church planting, planter of uh, Veritas Community in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and they'll be uh, sharing with the topic. But as we uh, go into the, uh, the conversation sharing, just want to make note that during this time, your cameras will be uh, off and your microphones will be muted. You can share uh, questions and comments in the chat box below. And uh, Ryan and Nate will pace themselves and, and try to uh, respond to as many questions and comments as possible and to have that conversation available in that way. Also CEUs uh, are available too of uh, uh, 0 0.1 and the link for that will be provided at the towards the end of the webinar. So for right now, for the next hour, you are invited to set aside or disconnect from anything that may be a distraction in order to more fully take in the content provided by Nate and Ryan, and also to, um, to reflect and ponder the questions and comments that are shared by others attending this webinar. And so it's great pleasure to have Nate and Ryan with us in this webinar today and I'll turn it over to them. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Dan. Uh, it's good to be here. Thanks for everyone to uh, tuning in to our time together. And uh, you'll see that we're gonna have some s slides. So there will be available as will a resource list of books that you can check out. So let me give me some history around uh, Veritas and what drives us and you can see how this is going to play out through the rest of our time together and how Anabaptist and Pius life has shaped our community. Um, our vision for Veritas that we have worked on hard over the last year or two uh, is the vision of Veritas is to be family pursuing truth with honest expression as we follow Jesus into the margins. Uh, we have six core values that drive our community. Uh, the first being uh, it's Jesus-centered, kingdom-minded, outward-orientated, communal, risk-taking, and creativity. And those are the things that drive us. And as I said, you'll find how we express those things in our life together as we go through this time and how the Anabaptist and Pietistic theology and life together uh, shapes how we do things. Uh, Nate's going to do the same. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Thank you all for, for joining us and for, for logging in. It's great to be uh, together and get to explore uh, what it is about uh, the Church of the Brethren uh, that makes us want to plant more churches of it. And uh, that is uh, for sure the combination of, uh, of pietistic and, uh, and Anabaptist um, thought that has uh, that gave rise to the founding of the Church of the Brethren. Uh, the Church and Drive, uh, the church plant uh, that I'm a part of, uh, exists to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ in the city of Saginaw and the surrounding area. We've got a special call to make disciples on the campus of Saginaw Valley State University through Standing in the Gap. Uh, Standing in the Gap is a campus ministry that we uh, started at one uh, campus here in Michigan, it's, um, and then we, we expanded it to three others. And we're, uh, we're looking to establish other, even more campus ministries and church plants in college towns across Michigan and beyond. And our vision is that the Church and Drive is an intentional community, uh, equipping people to discover, develop, and deploy their unique gifts to influence their world through Christ. And so that's, uh, that's what we're about. And as Ryan said, as we go through these 
uh, these different points on uh, Anabaptism, uh, you're going to see how these play out in both, uh, both of our expressions of, uh, of church. Just quick, a little background about uh, the Church of the Brethren. I'm going to do like a two-minute um, kind of theological history. And the, the Church of the Brethren, probably most of you know, uh, was founded officially in 1708, but there was a, a lot of, of thought and prayer and study uh, that went into, went into beforehand. And one of the first streams of thought was, was pietism. And pietism grew up in a little bit in the Reformed tradition, but mainly in uh, German Lutheran churches about 100 years or so after uh, Martin Luther had begun the Protestant Reformation or um, really kicked it into high gear. And the pietists, they felt like the, the state religion the, of the, the churches at the day, the, even the Lutheran church, the Reformed church, they had started on these great um, revival kind of kicks, but had, had kind of calcified. And so the pietists, they wanted things like, they wanted to stress things like spiritual relationship with Jesus, an intimate personal spiritual relationship with Jesus. They believe people ought to be personally studying the Bible at home. Uh, and they thought that Bible study ought to lead to a holy life. That's where they got the nickname pietist. Um, that was actually, a, like so many uh, labels, that was, that was one they were called to make fun of them, uh, but it, the name stuck. They liked it. Uh, and uh, they also thought that the lay people ought to have more to do. They ought to be more active in, in the life of the church and in faith. And they also thought that there should be no compulsion, no force in religion. Those were some key uh, pietist ideas. And then uh, the radical pietist felt like, you know what, that, that is right. And to do that, you've got to get out of any kind of established church, any kind of hierarchy, any kind of organized church is just going to get corrupt. And so we got we got to go. And that is where the, uh, the founders, Alexander Mack and the others, kind of started was in this radical pietist move. They were meeting in their own homes. They were studying the Bible. They were kind of withdrawing uh, from the churches they had been part of. But then they encountered the teachings of of Anabaptism, and uh, they were through their own study of the New Testament, they became convinced uh, that they were called to form a church, uh, to form an organized covenant community uh, that was uh, going to be a visible expression of the body of Christ in, in mutual submission to each other. And so that moved them kind of out of radical pietism into uh, Anabaptist ideas. And, and these Anabaptist ideas are what we're going to uh, list off for you right now. Um, Ryan's going to introduce them to us. So you'll see that pietist and radical pietist ideas are interwoven into these uh, principles that, that we're calling the principles of Anabaptism. Uh, yeah, Nate, thanks for that history lesson really quickly. But what you'll see on your screen is uh, we're working off of this document called 12 Principles of Anabaptism from the, Un from the Mennonite Brethren Church. We reached out to them and asked for permission to use and adapt their their uh, article, but you'll see also the website there uh, of how to how to get a hold of that uh, piece of, of uh, information. But I want to say hey, too that yeah, Ryan, I just saw in the chat. Can you pray before going further? Stan, uh, we we didn't pray to to open up. Yeah, yeah, I'll pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day for each one here. Lord, thank you for the tradition of Anabaptist and Pietism that we are a part of. Lord, uh, from down through the ages and how it has shaped and molded us to be more like you and to make more disciples who make disciples. And so, Lord, bless this time, we pray in your name. Amen. So, uh, so we're, we're using this uh, 12 principles of Anabaptism. Um, and what we want to say is that these principles have drives our praxis. Uh, these aren't just ideas that we've come up with that are cool or relevant uh the way we do our communal life together it's really rooted in these values and principles and we encourage you to take these principles and discern what they might look like in your own context these are just two different contexts uh in pennsylvania and michigan how two different church planters and church plants have sought to apply these 12 uh principles uh, in their own communities. And so just stressing that right from the start to allow you to be creative and discern those, uh, how they look like in your context. So the first principle uh, that we want to talk about is this, that Anabaptists had a high view of the Bible, 
they didn't worship the Bible. It, it wasn't, uh, that'd be biblical idolatry. Um, but they accepted the scriptures as the authoritative word of God and through the Holy Spirit, a guide to lead men to faith in Jesus and, and how to do Christian discipleship. Um, but I love what they say next. Is Anabaptists insist that Christians must always be guided by the word, which is to be collectively discerned and led by the spirit. And what does that look like, Ryan, when, you, when you're doing church at Veritas? So I love, I love it, the, the idea of collectively discerning uh, the scriptures, being led by community and discipleship and led by the spirit. And so what we do is we gather when we're, you know, can, and when we, before this time, we would gather around tables and during and after the sermon, we would encourage each group to dialogue around the text and what it means to apply that to their life as an individual, but also as a community. What do the scriptures say to us as a body gathered together? Um, same thing to you, man. What does it look like uh, to have a high beauty Bible in Michigan? You know, we do the same thing at the church and drive. We, the whole service is around round tables. And in a couple of points in the service, we have the people in the congregation meet around those tables and share life and discuss after the sermon, you know, what does that mean for me? How do, how do we apply these scriptures uh, to our lives? We let each other uh, speak into our lives. I'm going to talk more in later principles about one of the things that we stress at the Church of Drive is this mutual submission to one another that we, we, we involve the community in a lot of our decision making. And we think about how do my individual decisions affect other people in my community. And so, uh, yeah, to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to interpret the scripture and lead the group to to understand what what God is calling us to uh, through the scriptures, um, because we do believe that, that God speaks uh, through the Bible, and the Bible is the rule that we kind of use to measure everything else. Which leads us right to the next point. Uh, the Anabaptists have an emphasis on the New Testament. Uh, Jesus is uh, the word, capital W, of God. He is God's supreme revelation. And we make a clear functional distinction between the equally inspired Old and New Testament. We see the Old and New Covenant. We're, we read the Old from the perspective of the New and see the New as the fulfillment of the Old. And when the two differ, the New prevails, and we develop our ethic derived from the New Testament. And, and Veritas is a, is a New Testament church. What, what are you guys doing uh, that, that illustrates that principle? So we would teach that all scriptures ultimately point to Jesus. As I said, the word of God, capital W word. Uh, we would hazard a guess if like you did a breakdown of our uh, scriptures and our sermon series and what we spend the majority of our time in, my guess is it would be primarily focused on the New Testament, though we don't shy away from teaching the Old Testament, but we make sure that those scriptures are pointing to the ultimate fulfillment of, uh, in that of Jesus um, and what he wants for us to do in our life. Same question to you, man. Well, Andy Stanley's books have been really helpful to me in this. I don't know if he'd consider himself an Anabaptist, but uh, when I read his stuff, he, he seems, uh, seems to track with it pretty well. Uh, he talks about how we can understand what God was leading towards in the Old Testament. So we read the Old Testament for inspiration, uh, for history, for understanding what it was uh, that Jesus was fulfilling and um, what, what the people of God, what God was doing through his people uh, for millennia, but that we turn primarily to the New Testament for application, so that we we believe the Old Testament is yeah, inspired and, and equally inspired, like you said, but that we're going to look to the New Testament to teach us how we live now in this new covenant we have in in Jesus. And so um, we we've got uh, this helps with uh, sharing our faith with non Christians. We don't start off with arguing much about how old the earth is or some of the other things that. Um, that can trip people up. Uh, we start with Jesus and let him do the rest. We really focus a lot on the Sermon on the Mount 
and on Matthew 18, which kind of leads into uh, that our, our third principle of Anabaptism, uh, which is an emphasis on Jesus as central to all else. Anabaptists derive our Christology directly uh, from the word and emphasize a deep commitment to Jesus and to take his uh, message seriously in all of life. Such a view runs counter to the notions that the commands of Jesus are too difficult for ordinary believers. Uh, and that was one of, the, one of the key distinctives between Anabaptists and other Christian groups. What they did, I mentioned the Sermon on the Mount uh, in, the, in the last principle, and the, the Sermon on the Mount had been kind of explained away for hundreds of years. Some, some churches and traditions taught that the Sermon on the Mount was just this lofty ideal. It's just there, kind of like the Ten Commandments, to show you that you can't ever keep these, and you're just always going to fail. Or other people said, well, the Sermon on the Mount, that's how the clergy are supposed to live, or the monks, and that's for the super special holy people. Um, but regular people can't do it. Uh, and the Anabaptists came along and said, no, Jesus is the, the author of our faith. Jesus was, is God in the flesh. He, he lived life as a human to show us what it is to live a, a, a life as a human, totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. He meant what he said. And so um, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 18, all the other uh, teachings and commandments that Jesus ordained, that's why we call them ordinances, not, not uh, sacraments necessarily. He, he ordained, he gave us these, these ordinances that we are to, uh, to practice. And so that, uh, that's uh, real formative for Anabaptists and for both of our expressions of Anabaptism. Um, What's that look like at the uh, at Veritas? So um, the the past this past January, our servants team, which is the name of our leadership team, met together for a day long retreat to plan, pray, prepare for the year ahead. Now none none of us had COVID nineteen on our plans. We didn't see that coming, but we were sitting around and we were recommitting ourselves to our vision and to our values. And the first value we were committed ourselves to was being Jesus centered. That all else, everything that we do is centered on Jesus. Uh, he's our source of where our ministry and our activities flow. And so the six of us kind of voted on where we are in, in relation to meeting all these uh, core values. And the six of us, we, from zero to, from one to 10, one being, you know, we're not living that at all, or in 10 being, we have it completely down. Two people had put sevens, three had put eight, and one put nine. And so when we added all those numbers together, we came up with 47 out of 60. And so that seemed like a very strong uh, push towards being, living out that Jesus-centered reality. But also too, one of the things we teach is, is that if Jesus is central to everything, it, that we don't just say Jesus is a secretary of afterlife affairs, but that he's concerned of all of life, not just the afterlife, but now as well. And so how does the church and drive see Jesus as central to all else? Thanks. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that our, our mission is to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And so let, we understand disciple as a the word disciple means a disciplined follower, uh, a person who is trying to become as much like their teacher as possible. And we take some, uh, some New Testament scriptures uh, real seriously that Romans 8, 29, for example, says that it's the destiny of Christians to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus, uh, to look like Jesus. In Luke 6, 40, Jesus says that anybody who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Students not above his teacher, but anybody who's fully trained will be like their teacher. And in John 14, 12, Jesus says, anybody, anybody who's got faith in me, he's going to do what I've been doing and even greater things uh, that, that we're supposed to be doing the stuff Jesus did and that, that we are seeking to make disciples that look like Jesus. That's uh, what, what we're all about. Um, the, uh, the fourth principle that Anabaptists highlight and, uh, and, and emphasize is the necessity of the believer's church. Anabaptists believe that Christian conversion, while not necessarily sudden and dramatic, always involves a conscious decision. Unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, Jesus said. Uh, believing that an infant can have no conscious or intelligent faith in Christ, Anabaptists baptize only those who have come to a personal living faith and uh, voluntary baptism together with the commitment to walk in the full newness of life 
and to strive for purity in the church constitutes the basis of church membership uh, historically for Anabaptists. This is another case where kind of the nickname stuck. Anna, probably you know this, means re, re-baptist, re-baptizers. Uh, and so uh, the one of the distinctives that separated Anabaptists from everybody else was the mode of baptism that we used. And uh, in uh, Ryan, you got some pretty cool stories about how you uh, baptize at Veritas. Right. So uh, one of the favorite things we do as a community revolves around our baptism gatherings. Uh, many you'll note, many of our churches are named after moving streams of water. Uh, and many churches have baptized. And way back in the day, they would say it has to be moving. But so we gather when we have someone who decides that they're going to follow Jesus and they want to make that this, uh, decision public to the community, they decide that they want to be baptized. And so what we do is we throw a party because we feel like that is the, uh, that is the time you should party as, a, as a, a community of faith when someone decides to take that step into the water and be baptized. And so we put it in the terms of a party. And so we don't, in our, in our worship space, we don't have a baptistry, but in, in my back of my house, I have a hot tub. So we turn the, the jets on and watch that move. And then we have people, we baptize people and um, we throw a party, we have cake, we cheer, we scream. Uh, we enjoy it because we should say the Christian life is, uh, is the fullest life, John 10, 10. And uh, one of the coolest things I get to do is we also ask them, hey, do you have someone who has been crucial in your development in following Jesus? And would that person then like to participate in the baptism? That could mean that I don't or that we could do it in shared partnership. And, and that has been the most of the time we've baptized. We've done it in partnership with someone who's been crucial in their discipleship. And so I just feel like uh, baptis baptisms should be like the rowdiest thing that the church does. Um, so what about you and the church and drive? What does it look like to be a, a believer's church? Well, uh, sounds like we're coming from the same tradition and uh, we, uh, we, we've got a lot of similarities, obviously. Um, and, but I do need to take a page from you. I've only ever done one baptism in a hot tub, but I have a bunch of times had to chip through the ice uh, to baptize people. Uh, I work mostly with, uh, with college students at the, in, well, for a long time at the church and drive. And uh, we'd have these retreats and people, uh, would, would encounter Christ, and we'd do a very similar thing. Uh, somebody who'd been discipling them uh, would baptize with me, or, or sometimes, a lot of times, they just baptize them themselves, and I would watch. Particularly now that I'm a little older, when we have to chip through the ice, I'm happy to delegate uh, people for that part. But it is, it is a joy to see people take the commitment so seriously that they're going to get into frigid water, or they're going to you know, make this big public step of faith. And uh, yeah, when they share their story about why they're getting baptized, a lot of times, that plants a seed in, in somebody else who's listening and they want to come and, and be part as, as well. So that's, uh, uh, yeah, baptism is, is central to what, to what we do in part of our uh, disciple making. So uh, at this time, we were going to uh, take a minute and pause and uh, see if there are any questions. And we see I have, there's a couple. So let me ask you this, Nate. Paul asks, do either of the congregations you serve have mutual aid as a key component of life together in the faith? If so, please share examples of how that works. We've got, um, we've got a fund in our budget uh, to, to help people out. We got a deacon fund that people can contribute to if there's a need in the congregation. Um, we've got a, right now on our, on our signage, we've got, uh, we made a, it says help at churchanddrive.com. And if you need prayer, if you need assistance of something, you can send an email uh, and, and let us know. We'll try to get it. Uh, to to a play, if we can help, um, a, a couple years ago, uh, we uh, a guy in our church had this idea. We called it Love Fund. He was trying to kind of piggyback on the crowdsourcing, crowdfunding idea, where like if you have a need um, and you you can let us know, we'll, we'll try to cultivate a, a group of people who have the resources to meet that need, and people could volunteer. You know, hey, I'm good at uh, woodworking or, or carpentry, or I you know I can do electrical, or I can you know work on cars and. Uh, we've we've tried different different ways to connect needs that people have with uh, with resources, and we've had varying degrees of success uh, with with some of that. But what we what we have um, consistently seen is people in that that 
people kind of anonymously just step up and take care of needs within the body. You know, somebody will hear, hey, somebody, so-and-so got laid off or, you know, these folks just had a new baby and they, and the body takes care of, uh, of each other. It's pretty beautiful. Yeah, we would do the same. It was a lot of, I mean, we're a smaller community. So people, when they hear of needs or if they, we have, we use a, 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 an app called WhatsApp to just to like say, hey, we're all going here together or we're, we need prayer. We have one line in that app called prayer. And so uh, even today, somebody just said, hey, I, my family needs prayer. And so a lot of people are chipping in and praying. But also, if, if there's another need, we try to put that to work. We may try to go through the, the budget to do that, or we may uh, just see how it works with other people who step up and hear um, their, the need, and so that they just step into it. Uh, so another question is, do, uh, again from Paul, have you observed people coming into your respective new church plants with unhealthy experiences of church that you needed to address? If so, how did you and the congregation address them? Well, for sure, you know, we've, you know, we've been around for 13 years now, I think, at the Church and Drive. And so we've, we've had a bunch of people come from all kinds of different, uh, different backgrounds. And, uh, yeah, um, negative church backgrounds, no church backgrounds, uh, and positive church backgrounds. Uh, and I think each case is probably unique. Um, some people, you know, what, what's, uh, most of the people that I've, I don't know what most, a bunch of the people that I've baptized were baptized as babies. Um, and for whatever reason, um, kind of either left the faith they were, or the tradition they were brought up in, or um, encountered Christ in a new way through either the campus ministry or when they met somebody from the church and drive, and so, um, yes, some of those folks did have some baggage um, that Anabaptism helped, Anabaptist understanding of Christianity uh, helped them overcome some of the barriers that had been between them and, uh, and, and faith. So uh, in the, the Church and Drive, we're, we're pretty proudly denominational. We don't, uh, we don't think that the Church of Brethren is better uh, than any other denomination, and we're very aware of the faults, you know, and the, the troubles that the Church of the Brethren has, but do you think it's a, a fantastic, a beautiful expression of the faith at our best, uh, at our best, uh, that, uh, that is really timely for this generation and has helped a lot of people uh, overcome objections and, and hurts in the past uh, and, and embrace the life of faith. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, a lot of times the people that we meet don't necessarily show up on a Sunday morning as a kind of an entry point. We have, uh, we run our space as an art gallery and a music venue. And so over time, we got to realize that especially if there is uh, the younger, and I'm being, I'm being general here, most, a lot of times younger populations have no problem with Jesus, but they have a problem with those who represent Jesus, the church, when it, it at, from that, their perspective, it doesn't like, look like the Jesus that we say we follow. And so for us, it has just taken the time to get to know people, to live in front of them, the gospel that we say we follow, the Jesus that we say they, we follow. And that takes a long time. But if they, if they show up on a Sunday morning, we love them, we embrace them, we walk with them. We, um, if they have questions, uh, when they do have questions, as we all do, we think all questions are, are good, are questions that should be asked and we should dialogue. There is no, I think there's no conversation that the church shouldn't have some kind of statement in and, and address. And so we just journey with people and it, it, it takes a long, long time. Um, depending on where they're coming from, just to just to love into their life and say, hey, we're going to walk with you. And so um, lots of stories uh, about people who come and, uh, you know, bad experiences, no experiences uh, or good experiences. And so we just try to do that with all of, we meet them where they are and walk with them uh, on the way to towards Jesus, which brings me to my next to our next point about uh, the, the importance of discipleship. It's not just um, 
a belief system. It's not just, well, I believe this in my head, but it doesn't express itself in our holy living. In fact, in Christ, salvation and ethics come together. Um, and so, as I said, we're not only just saved through Christ, but we're all called to obey Christ, to live out a holy life, to follow him. Um, for for the Anabaptists, they would continue that salvation makes us followers of Jesus Christ. And he modeled how we are to live our lives in the here and the now. Pietists expressed the same commitment by gathering in small groups to study the Bible get together. And they felt that true Christians had to practice their faith every day. And it wasn't just a Sunday thing. Oh, I'll just follow Jesus on Sunday. And Monday through Saturday has no bearing on my uh, life. When you, uh, when you gather at Veritas, um, what does your discipleship model look like, Ryan? So Dallas Willard, a, a, a man that I uh, deeply respect, he had this to say about discipleship. He said, making disciples is the main task of the church. Every church ought to ask these two questions. One, what's your plan for discipleship? And two, is it working? And I wish I had an answer to that question is it working but we try to develop our discipleship around the model of spaces we believe there's four five different spaces and if you want more information on this let me know um can't do it justice in like two minutes but a sociologist by the name of ed hall said there were four spaces and then some other christians got together and said no we're going to add a fifth one the first one being the largest being the public space that's where we do our engagement with our network that, that we're part of, but also our, our uh, um, denomination. We do social space, 20 to 50. That's when our, we le seek to engage missionally in the world. And also our worship is around that number. Then we have our personal space, which is eight to 12. That's our community groups. Our transparent three to four, we're looking at trying to start discipleship groups of you know two to three people who meet together regularly to read the the gospels and pray together. And lastly, we uh, do one-on-one, -on -one, one to God, and we try to equip them with uh, discipleship tools, uh, Bible reading plans, devotionals, that kind of thing. What does discipleship look like for you in a church and drive? Well, like I mentioned at the beginning, we, we, our vision is to be an intentional community that's equipping people to discover, develop, and deploy their unique gifts. And so one of the things that's been so cool about working primarily uh, with, uh, with college students through Standing the Gap is um, that we, we've sent more people to seminary um, in the last uh, 15 years or so uh, than, uh, well, we've sent a bunch uh, to, to seminary. In fact, in, at uh, Bethany's uh, Board of Trustees, they commissioned a study a while ago. Uh, on their niche, and they, they found that most of their student body was coming from small liberal arts uh, Christian schools with peace emphasis studies, um, except for this anomaly in Michigan, uh, where these state schools, uh, Central Michigan University, Saginaw Valley State University, were sending uh, students down, uh, and so they call us the Michigan anomaly, because we're, uh, we're raising up, we're, we're deploying people uh, to find their calling and, and to grow in ministry. But we also strongly emphasize the priesthood of all believers. We know most people aren't going to go to seminary. Most people aren't uh, uh, called to be uh, pastors, but everybody's called to find out what gift God has placed in them. We, we put people through a curriculum that's a uh, network or the Church of the Brethren uh, Discipleship Ministries now has a spiritual gift inventory you can go through as well to help people find out, discover what it is that God has, has put in you and then we try to give people opportunities to grow in that gifting and then put them to work, deploy them and, and have them use the spiritual gifts that God has given to them to build up the whole body. Uh, that's again, real new Testament and, and discipleship is about you know, serving with the gifts you've been given, the talents you've been given, uh, the body of Christ and, and the world beyond. Um, so uh, yeah, we've, uh, we've had several people in our church, uh, begin nonprofits to to reach the one group's working with uh, the Brethren Medical Group in Haiti. Another group uh, founded uh, a ministry to support the Nigerian Christians. We've got um, yeah people get getting deployed all over the place, and it's it's really exciting. So the next point, uh, kind of basing going off that, is uh, Anabaptists would believe in an, an insistent on a church without class or division. 
Um, and so the church, the body of Christ, has only one head. It's not me. It's not Nate. It's not Stan. Mm. It's not any of us. It's Jesus himself. And while we say uh, we have functional diversity, we believe that we are called to set aside all racial, all ethnic, all class and sexual distinctions because they are, cons they are subsumed by the unity and the equality of the body of Christ. So Nate, tell me how, what does that look like? An insistence on a church without class or division uh, in your uh, community? Uh, real similar to that last one, that the priesthood of all believers means we've got a lot of people involved. We, we, we switched our leadership structure about a year ago to, to an administrative board where people can serve uh, in different capacities according to their interests and their gifts. Um, and, and they have a voice at the table. They've got uh, input in, in the leadership of of the church, we've got uh, men and women who preach and who teach and who lead besides me. Um, and uh, we were starting to diversify in terms of age too. For a long time, uh, we had college kids and just a, a, you know, I was like the oldest person in the church. Uh, and uh, now we're, I'm still towards the oldest, but I'm not the oldest. And uh, we're, we're getting people younger and older involved in, uh, in the life and the ministry of the church. Uh, how about you? Yeah, that sounds familiar. That was where we were for a long time, where it was like I was the oldest one or there might have been one or two older than me, but we have now diversified that age uh, group. We are, our youngest is, uh, you know, a couple months old. Our oldest is a couple in their 70s. Um, one of the things we've sought to do to live out this is in our servants team and our leadership team is that we uh, function uh, there are equal male and female representation. Uh, but one of the coolest thing is one of our members, Mike, uh, he had uh, a stint at uh, Water Street Rescue Mission, which is a big homeless mission here in town. And we didn't bring him in um, as like, oh, he's our like homeless guy representatives. He has gifts and he's committed to Jesus and the church. Um, he's just an amazing guy. He, he's the kind of the guy that, and I've said this to him many times, Mike, if you had um, one shirt on your back and somebody needed a shirt, you give it to him. He's just that kind of guy. And so we're equally divided, as I said, by male and female. Um, and we believe truly in, uh, as you said, the priesthood of all believers, but we also believe that should be open to male and female. And then uh, our teaching team, we have, a, a, as you mentioned too, we have a group of people who preach. I'll preach the majority, but then we have others and we have, it's male and female representation as well on our teaching team. Sweet. Hey, I, I see we've got yeah. some more questions in the, uh, in the chat box and we're going to, we're going to take a break. We have two more principles and then we're going to, we're going to get to as uh, many questions as we can in our, in our next break here. Um, so thank you for, for those questions. Um, this next principle is uh, belief in the church as a covenant community. And this is the idea that corporate worship, mutual aid, fellowship, and mutual accountability characterize our community. An individualistic or a self-centered anabaptism is a contradiction in terms. And, uh, you know, that, it goes really uh, against what it is that, uh, that we're <laughs> kind of, that, that gets publicized in America, right? We're individualistic, we're self-centered sometimes, uh, and the U.S. is all about this rugged individualism. Uh, so, Ryan, at, the, at Veritas, what do you guys do to live out this principle? So one of the things we do is we don't necessarily have a quote-unquote membership uh, per se in our community, but we do have what we call a community commitment process, where every year we gather together around our vision and our values and how we do life together. And we encourage and challenge our people to look it over and discern, hey, for this year, I'm going to commit myself to this body who lives out the faith in this way. Um, and so it's the rule of life. And so they're committing themselves, not just like, oh yeah, I follow Jesus, but they're also committing themselves for a year to a particular expression and a to particular community of people. 
Um, yeah. Do we have people who then say half a year in, you know, things happen? Yeah, of course. We have a very uh, transient community. Um, but we really hold each other in that and say, hey, we're going to do life together. We're going to be in relationship with each other because we cannot do life alone. And that's why the first thing we say as our community is we want to be family. Um, and that means redefining that for a lot of people. Um, so what does that look like in your neck of the woods? You know, I, I mentioned that we earlier, we, we really get involved with each other's lives and we invite the members uh, to, and the leaders to everybody, uh, to, to bring their decisions to the wider body. You know, with uh, college kids, a lot of them are thinking about, you know, where are we gonna major? Should I take this internship, that internship? Uh, should I propose to my, to my girlfriend? And uh, to get uh, mature Christian friends and, uh, and brothers and sisters in Christ to weigh in uh, on those kind of big deal decisions. Um, should, I, should I take this job that's gonna have me and my family move out of the area or should I, you know, all these different, different questions because we're covenanted together, uh, we, we take those seriously and we, we look out for each other. We, you know, not in a manipulative way or any kind of like cultish kind of stuff that you, you hear people getting wacky with, but uh, it's been beautiful to, to allow other people to pray for us and to, to ask hard questions, to, uh, to really help you figure out, is this really what God's calling you to do? And um, I didn't get this book on the resource list, but I, I mentioned it at the webinar last year. It's called Church Membership by Jonathan Lehman. And it was uh, really, um, really good. I thought it was really, I agreed with probably 90% of what was in there. And uh, just, he takes church membership really seriously. And that's, that's challenged us at the Church and Drive to, uh, to think about what it means for us to, to commit ourselves to, uh, to the body. One of the things that, that it does mean is this next uh, principle uh, that the Anabaptists have stressed that, that we need to separate from the world uh, and that the church is a visible counterculture. The, uh, the Mennonite brethren that we borrowed this from uh, have these as two different principles. We combine them because I think there's, it's, it's two sides of the same coin, right? You separate from the world and, and that makes you visible as this countercultural thing, uh, church. Uh, the community of the transformed belongs to the kingdom of God. It functions in the world, but is radically separate from the world. The faithful pilgrim church sees the sinful world as an alien environment with thoroughly different ethics and goals. This principle includes separation of church and state. Therefore, Anabaptists reject all forms of civil religion, be it the traditional Christendom or more recently developed forms of Christian nationalism. And uh, this is, again, radical pietists were right there too. They had to, they took us even further and, and fled uh, any kind of organized uh, religion. Uh, I, as a united fellowship of believers, every Anabaptist congregation models an alternate community. Such a covenant community functions as an authentic uh, counterculture. Um, in the Church and Drive, I'll just jump in for the sake of time here and say at the Church and Drive, we talk about how God bless America is too small a prayer uh, for a church to pray. We are a global faith. Jesus started a global movement, a kingdom uh, that doesn't have any earthly boundaries, and that kind of flies in the face of, of make America great again or anything. I'm not getting too political here, but there is, there is a role that the church has that is different from the state. And that's why the early Anabaptists and, and Anabaptists from then on have said, there's a separation of the church and the state because we're part of this bigger uh, kingdom. Yeah, we would, we would uh, talk about living out a third way faith. Um, in fact, uh, a few years ago, we did a sermon series entitled a third way to follow Jesus. Because so often I think what happens in this, especially, we get uh, polarized more so all over our, our community. And so it's not about, you know, I live in Lancaster, so everybody's like, oh, Amish. And so that's like people think, oh, when you separate from the world, you become like Amish. You like dress differently, you move somewhere else where you only gather together. So we don't do that, but then other Christians uh, create their own, um, culture as well. And so we got to say, we can't uh, remove ourselves from the world and we can't, it's kind of like somebody said, we are in the, we are in the world, but not of the world, but not out of it either. That's uh, Leonard Sweet says that. And so we try to live a third way existence um, in our politics, in our theological uh, teaching and ethically 
Um, you know, when our world wants us to go this way or this way, we, we've always looked at Jesus and say he, when he gets pushed into those either or uh, dichotomies, he's always somewhere else. He's always above it. Um, and so we try to model that okay. in our life. Um, and I think that really in our time, if you can live a third way existence, I, I don't know uh, how you, you wouldn't be considered counterculture because you're just not being drug into those dichotomies that our world and even our church wants us to live into. Some good stuff, Ryan. You should be a preacher. Um, this is, uh, no, we, we're going to take another break here. I see in the chat box, we do have a bunch of questions and we're going to have to go uh, fast with some of these, uh, Ryan, but um, because we do want to get be done by three o'clock, but we will, uh, we'll try to get our content, uh, done by three and then you can stay after for, for more questions after that. But uh, Sam asked, uh, what is your view about children baptism, uh, especially children believers? Can you explain anything about children's church or children's ministry in our church plants? What do you guys do there, Ryan? So we would say that we dedicate children. We don't baptize them, but we do bring them in up uh, in the faith along with their uh, parents. And so we just had a couple uh, dedications of, of infants. And so we brought the family up in front of the community. We asked them questions about bringing that child up in the faith. And then we turned to the whole community and say, uh, they're part of our community. And so we get challenged to help disciple this child in the ways of Jesus as much as we do with the parents. And so all, the whole family, we seek to disciple um, it, it would go too long to talk about how, what we do for children's ministry, but we, we use a more of a family model where uh, other than small children, the, the kids are with us pretty much all the way through. Um, so that's kind of what we do. So if you have other things you want to uh, uh, hit too. Man, we, we, we do a lot of the same things. We have we don't have children's church. We've got the kids with us, um, except for, like you said, four and under, there, there's a nursery for them. Uh, everybody's, we made around tables. And so the, the parents, you know, there's some coloring stuff for the kids. Um, but then we, as soon as we can, get them involved. You know, we have kids help take up the offering or uh, read in scripture. And uh, it's really beautiful. Like you said, the, the child dedication, when the child who's dedicated a few years ago, uh, we when the, when the children are dedicated, like you said, we ask the church to say, you know, these are church kids now. These are all of us have this responsibility to help with the spiritual nurture of this child. And then when that child is baptized, decides to be baptized when they're older, uh, it's, uh, the whole church celebrates and has a, had a hand in that. Uh, it's a, a beautiful thing. We've got, uh, and, uh, Mark asks, can you say more about the Sermon on the Mount? You preach strongly against lust, anger, et cetera. Are we to gouge out our eyes or uh, did our fur forebear see a different purpose for the Sermon on the Mount. Um, when I preach on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, do, yeah, do take it seriously that, uh, that Jesus doesn't want us to, to be lusting or, or angry. Um, I think that uh, when, you know, he's, some things clearly are hyperbolic. He doesn't really want us gouging our eyes out. Um, but I think that our forebearers, the ethic I, I think that was there is that this is this is real. Like Jesus wants us to turn the other cheek. He doesn't want us fighting back. He wants us uh, to to make peace and to to be you know, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That He meant it. Um, do you do you talk a lot about those things, Ryan? Yeah, and I think I think the the key there, at least for me, is his prayer is the is the uh, prayer that says, you know, your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what, what the Sermon on the Mount does for me is say, that's how you live out the kingdom of heaven in the reality of our world today. It gives us a way of unpacking, living, following Jesus in the here and the now. If heaven dropped down in the place where you live, this is what it would look like. And so there, there wouldn't be anger. There wouldn't be lust. There would be love, forgiveness, grace, mercy, compassion. There would be no needs. All those things that he lays out, we know that we're not there yet, but it is about living the kingdom now in the present. So we always say, 
we, we our space is on King Street and say, what would it look like if heaven dropped down on King Street? That's how we should live our life in the present. That's sweet. It's like uh, Ray uh, is uh, making a comment that uh, yeah, we need to work on gender equity in, uh, in, in racial, cultural, and class areas too. Um, Don wants to know if we feel our worshiping communities really understand what the priesthood of all believers means. Uh, my guess would be some do and some don't. I think some, some people do come to watch the sage on the stage kind of thing. You know, we're, we're here to watch a show. We want to be spectators. Um, but in my interaction with a lot of churches, brother congregations, it does seem like there's a really active lay presence that, that there is, uh, there are a lot of, a lot of communities that really do understand the priesthood of all believers. So I, I would guess it probably varies. Um, it's something for sure we push to the church and drive, and I know you do at Veritas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing at time? You want to jump on? Let's... What's that? You want to just let's finish it out, and then we can hit back. Okay. Uh, All right, go for it. Yep. Yep. So uh, the next one is one of those things like you know we're very familiar with with but the belief that the gospel includes a commitment to the way of peace modeled by the prince of peace that shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us uh anabaptists here differ from many other christians that we believe that our peace position is not optional not marginal but also get this not related mainly to the military on the basis of scripture in the new testament uh anabaptists renounce violence and human relationships in all forms we see peace and reconciliation as being at the heart of the gospel. God gave his followers this ethic, not as a point to ponder, not as a belief in your head, but actually a command to obey in the here and the now. It was costly for Jesus, obviously. And it honestly may be also costly for us as followers. The way of peace is really a way of life. And so what does it look like to be about a gospel of peace in, in Michigan? The, the church drive from, from the beginning, we took our, our mission from uh, when God says to his people who are in captivity in Babylon, he says, seek the peace and prosperity, the shalom of the city uh, that you're in. Pray to the Lord for it, for as it prospers, you too are going to prosper. And so that idea of shalom, that, yeah, that, that the, the gospel of peace uh, for sure, uh, includes you, you're not going to go kill people uh, because you got a different season than I got. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but also, uh, I'm going to be working for God's will be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. Just like what you said, what Jesus taught us to pray, Ryan. That's the idea of shalom, and, and that is uh, central to what we're organized uh, around. Uh, how about you? Yeah, I would say that's the word, man, right? Shalom. It is the wholeness and the healing. And like I say, I love to say it's the way things should be. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, uh, and we've talked about peace and living a nonviolent life, being a pacifist, if you will. And that has honestly been one of the, the pieces that people have pushed back the m most. But we've tried to put it not just in that, but in, again, is that whole, more holistic thing. And that is about all of life. It's about um, our relationship with God, our relationship with ourself, our relationship with others and all of creation. And we see this um, in the way of Jesus. And we want to model that existence, that shalom life in all uh, forms and in all of our whole existence. Um, and so we go from one, uh, one principle that we hold very close to another one that uh, we hold very close. Uh, the commitment to being a servant. Uh, Jesus said, I've come to, I've, I've came to be a servant, not to serve, but to serve and give my life as a ransom. And so our picture of Jesus Probably, other than on the cross, one of the fullest pictures that our communities would hold is that picture of Jesus on his knees with a towel around his waist, washing the disciples' feet. And so we would say, that is our model. We are to be the towel bearers in this world, to serve one another as Christians, but also serve others in the name of Jesus. Um, and so now more than ever is a call for the church to look, to take up the towel and to wash people's feet. 
What does servanthood look like to you? Well, at the, uh, you know, and this is super familiar, right, to anybody. If you've been in the Church of the Brethren very long, you know, you're really resonating with everything you just said, uh, Ryan. We, we've sent people on, on um, disaster response trips uh, that the denominations put on. Uh, we, we regularly, we volunteer monthly at the City Rescue Mission here in Saginaw. Um, I mentioned the, the nonprofits that members of our church have formed to, to address global needs. And um, we've had a group of college kids that got together and, and organized a, a nonprofit, a 5K, to raise money for victims of human trafficking. And so the, the, the commitment to discipleship flows into this, uh, this commitment to serve, uh, serve our communities. And this is something that, that I think is really attractive, again, to this generation about the Church of the Brethren. Uh, what do you guys do uh, over at Veritas? So uh, every fifth Sunday of the year, four times a year, we cancel our worship and we worship in the street, meaning we go out and serve. And, you know, we pick up trash. We work with local nonprofits. We uh, help fight human trafficking in various ways by making uh, scarves. We do prayer walks. But it's not just every fifth Sunday. We try to say, hey, in your neighborhood, what does it look like to be good news to a people? people and to get involved that way to listen and then figure out what does serving look like in your neighborhood and and step into that awesome our our last principle that we are, are going to cover before we get uh, into uh, kind of wrap up and, and try to answer more of the questions in the chat is the insistence anabaptists have this insistence on the church as a missionary community uh, we believe that christ has commissioned the church to go into all the world and all of society and to make disciples of all people, baptizing them uh, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe his commandments, Jesus's commandments. Uh, the evangelistic imperative is given to all believers. This is uh, something Alexander Mack, our founder, was you know, really uh, committed to and, and the Church of the Brother movement found spread quickly. Um, so yeah, that, that commitment to, to missionary work, to being a missional church. What does it look like to be a missional church in the context of which you uh, call home? The church and drive our constitution. Uh, we put it in the constitution that we're going to set aside money uh, for that we receive for new churches and new campus ministry starts that um, that from our from our founding, we were thinking we're, we're going to be launching. We're going to be sending more disciples uh, and, and ministry leaders into the world to, to pioneer uh, churches of the Brethren congregations and campus ministries uh, where they where they aren't already, and so we're working to create this network of standing the gap chapters and Church of the Brethren churches and these college towns across Michigan and uh, and beyond. That's uh, and then of course there's interpersonal evangelism that's happening all the time when our members are talking to their neighbors and coworkers and friends and family. What do you uh, at, uh, in in Lancaster there? What's uh, what's the missional church look like for you? Yeah, so one of the things we do is our, even our space is, is designed to be a missional space. It doesn't look like a traditional church building or anything. In fact, it, I mean, we use it when, you know, when we're open, when we can now, now that we haven't done it for a while, but we host um, art shows. We bring in local artists, those who may be Christian, those who may not be. Um, we hold that. We engage with the life of the community around it. Um, and so if there's an event, First Friday, we hold something on First Friday. Third Friday, which is Music Friday, we bring in musicians. Um, we partner with the, uh, there's a, twice a year, they have Art Walk. And so we host art as well. We use our facility for parties and events and people who rent it from us so that there's a practical side of funding a space, but also develop relationships and that's what we really say it's about the development of the relationships over the long haul and people know that hey those people really care about the things in this city um, they care about the floor they may not they won't call it this but they would say the flourishing of this community and we would say yeah we want to be about that same thing um, and and then we encourage as you're saying what does it look like to be a missionary even though that word has uh, a lot of negative connotation, uh, colonialization and all that. But we do say, what does it look like to be missionaries in the places where you live, work and play? And so we encourage and challenge and say, and, and most of that people, what does that look like? Well, do you know your neighbor's name? 
maybe that's your first step. And so encourage them to just, because I think too often we put it up high here and then they go, I can't do that. You hear the, pre they hear the preacher says, I was on a plane and I did, I, I shared my faith and they came to know Jesus. And they're like, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. And then we just go, do you know your neighbor's name? Get to know them, invite them over for dinner and look at it as a long haul. And so that's what we really encourage people to, to be engaged in. Ryan and Nate, I need to uh, step in for a moment here. Uh, want to share with everyone the link to the CEU page where you can request uh, continuing education credit for this webinar. The, uh, when you go in and, and submit the information, the, uh, we take the information and send it to Brethren Academy and Brethren Academy will then send uh, you a, um, an email with the CEU certificate enclosed. And also I wanna thank uh, Nate and Ryan for the presentation today and for everyone that participated in this event is terrific. They're gonna hang around and do some more questions. And so thank you. Oh, thank you, Stan. So, yeah. uh, and thanks hey. for anybody who's gotta, thank you for joining anybody who's gotta go. Thanks a lot for being part of this. Really enjoyed uh, being here with you. And yeah, we'll try to answer as many of these questions as we, as we can. Yeah. So uh, Paul has another question, and I want to throw it to you because uh, I don't want to answer this question. No, I'm, just, <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. I do. I, I'm fine. But how do you how do your congregations allow the various political and economic ideologies that people have while not delving into politics, or do you? I just uh, it's funny. I just preached about this on Sunday. Um, that we uh, we want to be a church that people are so committed to Jesus and so committed to being community um, that even though we have these passionately held ideas, when somebody gets baptized, they don't immediately stop being a, a Democrat or a Republican or whatever it was they were before they came, right? I and mean, they still, they carry some of that with them. You know, we all do uh, political ideas, economic ideas, uh, but we've got we've to recognize that our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus and uh, that we, we don't let any of those secondary or tertiary, no matter how passionately we feel about them, how important we think they are, uh, they can't trump the ultimate loyalty we have to Christ, which means we have to have loyalty to one another. So I said, what a beautiful thing it will be. And it, it is that we have people who are passionately on one side and passionately on the other, and they can be themselves. They can talk about those things. And, uh, and then we see the show the world, look, uh, yeah, these people have these differences, uh, just like the early church. They, they had all kinds of fights in the early church, right? There were Jews and Gentiles had trouble getting along, and the slaves and the free and the men and the women. Uh, but they're all one in Christ Jesus. And a whole lot of the New Testament, I think, can be paraphrased as Paul or Peter, somebody saying, hey, knock it off <laughs> right? and, uh, and, and get along. You, know, uh, don't, you don't have to quit being a, a Republican or a Democrat or you know, whatever, but you have to, to have those loyalties in proper perspective to the ultimate loyalty and that the uh, Andy Stanley again I'm gonna quote him says you can't let a view get in front of a you uh, that your your view can't can't you know just color a whole whole other person you got in front of you yeah we would say I mean ultimately the ultimate allegiance is not to uh, a political party to a person it's to Jesus but at the same time I think we, we don't want to go the other way and say Jesus wasn't political because that's not true. He just right. wasn't political in the way that the world wanted him to be political. And so what ends up happening, and as I mentioned earlier, we have people who want us to fall in either category as far as politics go. Are you Republican? Are you Democrat? You can't be a Christian and be Republican, or you can't be a Christian and be Democrat. And I'm like, let's point to the higher one. Let's point to Jesus, how he over, over sells them over on those things and says, you know what, I'm not going to buy into your either or dichotomy. And so it's pointing to Jesus and say, you know what, there are platforms in the Democratic Party that seem to, on the surface, point to the way of Jesus. And on the surface is the same with Republican. And so we don't say, as you would say, you don't, you don't necessarily have to give up your political views, but you can't let that come in the way of seeing your brother or sister as the enemy. Because I hear people all the time saying, 
no, well, I can't worship you if you're a Republican or if you're a Democrat or those those people are vile. There, in my opinion, there is no place for a, a follower of Jesus to lower themselves to that level. You can disagree, be my guest, but don't disengage. And that's a great. And, and don't that's great. Uh, disagree, don't disengage, but do it in love. And those, in my opinion, when you are able to do that and live in a higher plane, people go, they can't understand it. Where mm -hmm. in the world does that happen? And they go only with the people who put Jesus first. That's right. You know, I, I, I think this, this is, a, I don't want to spend too much here because we got other questions to get to, but just, this is so, I think we, you know, we talk a lot about agreeing to disagree. And I think, you know, for a lot of things that can be where you end. Yeah. Okay. We just disagree, agree to disagree on, on things that don't matter that much. You like, butter pecan ice cream and I like chocolate, whatever. Um, but on, on bigger, you know, things we do care. Hey, you know, I really care a lot about this issue and you should too. Uh, hey, bring it. Let's talk about it. What if we were at a place where like with, with big deal stuff, we love each other so much that agreeing to disagree is where we start. And then we keep at each other. We keep wrestling with each other. Uh, keep doing this hard work where, you know, if I'm wrong about something, you think I'm, I'm wrong about something, and it's a big deal. Convince me, you know, persuade me. We have this idea that we just, well, that's your opinion. That's my opinion. We got to leave each other alone in that. No, I mean, I've, I've had my mind change because some really good friends uh, spoke to me and I've seen that happen the other way around too. So uh, let's not be afraid to, to get into the, the big stuff. Yeah. 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 So another, uh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. You go ahead. Uh, all right. Well, uh, Quentin says here, um, Oh, we've seen this too. I can, I can relate a little bit here. Uh, it says, we have a tension with a number of young adults who are attracted to reform theology that conflicts with our Anabaptist teaching, at least in their rigid thinking. Have you experienced this? And if so, how do you address it? So I would say uh, we have uh, at times, especially in terms of what we do after the sermon, when we have our uh, dialogue around the scriptures and we believe that the spirit uh is in in the midst of that and so we've had people who have differing opinions and there are some who have tended to be more reformed in their thinking have been pretty uncomfortable um uh with that idea they it kind of wanted you know just to preach the gospel and then everyone um uh, has to kind of fall in line behind that interpretation if you will versus like unpacking scriptures in community. Um, and so we've had people who come and they don't stay very long, but we have one guy who stayed very, a very long time, always told us he was reformed. We were okay with that. Uh, I'm still good friends with him to this day. Um, but eventually he just, he just always, he said, I always feel like I was trying to um, defend or whatever. And he, I just, it was a weird place for him to be. But I would say, number one, uh, even though we may disagree and for some s significant ways of seeing Jesus, God, the Old Testament, a lot of things overarching, they are our brothers and sisters, right? Um, and so I would say, if, if, as long as it's okay with you to stay in those relationships, still uh, ask questions, learn from them, but then continually present how you see it, especially from an Anabaptist pietistic perspective. This is what I love about being, one of the main things I love about being an Anabaptist, it helps us in the last one, um, last question about the politics and everything. We're, we, we understand the separation of church and state, that we're part of a, a higher kingdom. Uh, and that helps us with that. And in this case, for me, the way I approach it when I'm uh, talking with, with people, especially young adults, you know, young adults that uh, I've come to view that more of as a developmental stage, you know, that there's a, they learn something new and like, this is it, man, this is the way it's got to be. And, you know, when, when you're 21 or 22, you know, there's lots of stuff that can seem that way. Um, these are, uh, but then, you know, there's, there's a developmental piece to it. I think that you got to have some patience with, but then also, um, when I'm talking with somebody who's really into, you know, trying to figure out, is there predestination or is it free will or, you know, is there, is there the eternal security or the preservation of the saint or can I lose my salvation? You know, what, what we say, the, the church, of the brother doesn't have an official position on those things. And I think it's because we emphasize following Jesus, doing what he said. 
So uh, in, a, in a practical matter, for me, whether if a person can lose their salvation or can't lose their salvation, for example, um, or, or either one, worse for both ways, if you're predestined and you're just picked uh, or you're, you're not, I can't know that, uh, which one's picked and which one isn't, if that's how it goes. And so my job, whether I'm reformed or whether I'm me, is to say, I'm supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel to make disciples. And so uh, it makes no functional difference for the faithful Christian, whether there is uh, the uh, eternal security or not, or predestination or not, my job is to the same. If I see a brother in sin, I'm not supposed to just say, well, uh, they prayed a prayer when they're seven, I'll just leave them go because I believe in eternal security. No, I'm supposed to go and confront them in love. Uh, if I think they've lost their salvation, then even even more impetus, I guess. But uh, the the what I call sometimes the genius of the brother, we just, we follow Jesus and we leave all that other stuff to him. My job's the same either way, whether it's predestination or, or free will or, or what have you. So... James asked, do you have a charter based on your vision statement that people sign as a witness to their faith in Christ and loyalty to the church? We have a statement of faith, statement of belief in our constitution, and we teach it in our membership class, and we say, uh, basically, um, these things here are, you know, there's uh, six or eight, um, six or eight tenants, basically, you know, depending on how you break them out. Uh, we said, you know, it's not necessarily that you could, you don't, if you disagree with some of these, you're not a Christian, uh, maybe, but it's probably if you have a problem with these six or eight things, this probably isn't the best fit for you. And we're real honest. Like we'd say a lot, we know the church and drive, it's not for everybody. Um, and um, we are, we are seeking to be this, uh, this intentional community uh, that's about the business of, of helping people discover, develop and deploy their unique gifts, impact the world through Christ. Not everybody wants that. Some people want a place where they can show up and be a spectator um, they don't want to sit around a table and talk with a stranger uh, and, and become friends. And some people uh, don't want to be at a place where there is this, this commitment to a, a content of the faith or um, you know, more explicit. So we, we know not everybody's going to be there. We don't ask them to sign it. We say, you know, this, this is something to, uh, to affirm that we ask people who are becoming members to affirm these, uh, our statement of faith. Do you have anything like that at Veritas? Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. I would say our, it's not a charter. It's this our community commitment process, which I mean, it's a process which ends up at the end with this document of rule of life of saying, I'm going to, I'm gonna, we give it to them and they actually have a chance to say, what does it look like? So if one of our values is to be family, we give them space to say, for this year, what's that one step you may take to live into being family with other followers of Jesus? And then they have space to, to fill it out or to, what does it look like to be missional? We use the terms moving into the margins, uh, following Jesus into the margins. And so we give them space to, to say, here's my commitment. Um, and then every year, new people go through a process to get to that place. But those who've been with us for a while just keep coming back to that every year. We hand it out towards the end of, this, uh, end of the year. And early in January, we read through it together. We re reaffirm it. And some people will never sign it. They'll say, look, I'm committed. I don't need to sign a piece of paper. And they are committed. And so that's up to them. Uh, but we do have that process that we try to take as many people through as possible. If Wallace asks, do you think that the church struggles today uh, to open the door for new church plants? I think there, I think, I mean, I know I hear a lot of problems like uh, historically, you know, we had church plants and we spent a lot of money and we didn't get a lot of bang for the buck. And why are we spending a lot of that money? Um, or if our, if our established churches are having so much problem, why are we spending time with um, church planting? But I want to say that it's not an either or, it's a both and. We need new church plans, but we also need revitalization. And they're not as far away as we tend to push. They're very similar. Um, but I would say part of it is um, maybe, a, maybe a cure for that, if you will, is to um, talk with people, develop the relationships um, with a local church planner be it somebody in the church of brethren, or honestly, even not, like just develop a relationship um, with someone. Or even look, even look in your own body 
and say, are there people in our own community who may uh, have a call that we need to help uh, inspire and help flourish? I think for sure it's gotten a lot better. When when we first got going, I'm sure I, uh, you and I got going around the same time with our church plants. And there, there were some folks who said it, we, exactly what you said. I had people in, in the district who said, we've got struggling churches here already. Why do we need, uh, why are you starting a new one? Um, uh, but also, like you said, the revitalization and the church plant go together. Uh, I see uh, Cheryl's on from the Midland Church, which I'm also the pastor of the Midland Church, uh, which is an established congregation. And we're, we're working on a revitalization uh, using some of the same techniques uh, reaching out to the young adults in campus ministries that we used uh, to plant the, the church and drive. Uh, so there was for sure some opposition that uh, we encountered back when we first got going. I think things are better now uh, than they were before. And I would echo uh, and just to kind of tack on what Ryan said. But one of the best ways that I felt supported when we were just getting the church and drive going for the first two, three years was when somebody would come from one of the other churches in the district or from the denomination we had. Uh, several people come and visit from the denomination. And it gave me a chance to, sh to show the people in the church, hey, we're part of something bigger. You're part of, you know, there's a whole lot of people you've never met that are praying for you, that are rooting for you, that are uh, you know, contributing uh, some resources for you. And so we know money's tight and not everybody's got uh, money that they can give, but it, it just to show up on a Sunday or on a, the public worship service and, and let the church planting team know that you're rooting for them, you're praying for them, that, is, uh, that, is, that goes a long way. There's another question here from Mark. Uh, says, sorry to hit this again, but do we really preach the Sermon on the Mount as a legalistic message? Is the Sermon on the Mount not meant to undo self-righteousness? Yeah, I, I sure don't think it's a legalistic message, right? Um, yeah, I'm not really... What I meant to say with the Sermon on the Mount was that the ethic that Anabaptists historically have, have sought to live by. That's, that's the... What part of the expression of the, the Anabaptists is that, that the Sermon on the Mount is, yeah, Jesus meant it. It's, it's not meant to be a legalistic, like we all, we all fall short, right? We all um, uh, stumble in, in many ways, but that it is, it's not pie in the sky. It's, it's like, yeah, if, you, if somebody hits you and you hit them back, uh, Jesus isn't clapping, right? <laughs> That's, um, I, they, I don't know, do you have anything you want to add to that, Ryan? No, I, I think we, we take his beautiful ethic and we make it legalistic and we lose the point. We lose the, the narrative, if you will, because he didn't, he didn't come to make another law. He came to free us so we didn't have to live under the law. And so, but he, that doesn't mean we don't have an ethic to live by. It just doesn't, it's just like, oh, you don't have to live by that, so do whatever you want. But he calls us to live out under that uh, a much freer existence. Um, and so, no, we shouldn't like hammer legally. This is it because then we're back to the old, the old covenant, if you will, and not the new uh, covenant under Jesus who said, I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. It's, it's living out the Sermon on the Mount is the fullest expression of what it looks like to live the kingdom and mm -hmm. the fullest life, honestly, the best, the best life. So. Yeah. Uh... Ryan, how many, uh, let's see, I was asked, how many new people come to worship with you each year? How many stay? Oh, uh, boy, I have no idea on either one of them. Um, I, I would say we have fairly regular visitors before COVID-19, um, but not a lot, but not, I would say the majority stay. I mean, that's just always, that's the way it is with almost any church, right? You have a percentage of visitors and then a percentage of that stay. Um, and honestly, what we really uh, try to not be about is about defining everything by a Sunday morning worship experience. Um, that's, for our case, that's uh, normally two hours in length from beginning to end, including relational hangout, all that. Um, but all of our, the rest of our life is important too. And so we talk a lot about what does it look like to live out the kingdom in the everyday, in the places you work, live, and you play, um, instead of like holding up the highest thing is coming on a Sunday morning to a church service. Not that we don't 
want people, not that we don't encourage people to invite other friends, but a lot of our growth, I would say, happens from people inviting other friends versus somebody finds us on the internet. I mean, we've had that, and occasionally people stay, but most of the ones who stay are our relationship. They already know somebody. They've already seen the way they do their life, and it kind of flows in through that. Because a lot of times, you know, we may have people coming in and going, oh, I like your cool website. They look at that. They may look at, like, oh, it's, it's not too big. It's around tables. It's not a place to hide. It's not a performance. And so they may not be fit for us, and that's fine. We just believe find another place uh, and we have friends all over. We'll give you, we'll, we'll like, we'll tell you other churches to be a part of. Um, but yeah, that's a hard, it's a hard uh, question to even uh, say, but maybe you have a better answer than I do. Uh, no, same. Uh, I think uh, we probably have more visitor. We have probably visitors more weeks than we don't, I'd say. Um, we don't have visitors every week probably, but uh and more often than not, we've got at least uh, somebody who's there for the first time or uh, relatively new. And then, um, yeah, some people love it and other people are like, oh, I'm not coming here again because, yeah, the tables and the, the, uh, you know, the, the interactivity that we, we, we encourage and we it's basically part of the service. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, so we, um, we've got about 50-ish people that'll worship with us on a Sunday when we're in person. And uh, we, well, we send a lot out. That's the, we, we've got a real tr transient group. Like you said, you have at Veritas, you know, young adults, college students. And so we, every year, uh, we send some people out. Um, they, they're going to grad school. They're going to get a job. And, and every year we bring in new folks. Um, and we're, we're working at connecting, keeping those connections going with the people we send out to. And one of the neat things that's happened in this pandemic, one of the blessings I think God is, is doing is that we've actually had people uh, we've grown some as we've gone online and we're going to keep zoom uh, as we go back whenever it is we go back to in-person worship we're going to keep zoom we're putting some resources and some personnel into uh continuing on so that people wherever they live we've had every every sunday we've had people from virginia to washington state and in between uh join us and we're, we're hoping to continue that and, and and learn how to bring those people joining us from a distance into the community and uh, they're not just going to be spectators, but, but participants, and Zoom lets us do that. Yeah, so uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and the great questions. And again, uh, Nate would probably say the same thing, but if you have further uh, questions and you want to dialogue, please, hey, find us online on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and uh, ask your questions. We're, we're more than happy to engage then. Um, but Nate, uh, since I started with prayer, would you close us? Absolutely. Father, thank you so much for this uh, great opportunity to talk about uh, new expressions of the body of Christ. We thank you for, uh, for this tradition, uh, this heritage that's been handed to us, of those who've gone before us. And we know, uh, Lord Jesus, that you, you're coming back for a pure and spotless bride for one body, and that the Church of the Brethren is, is one part of, of a universal uh, an eternal uh, church that you died for and rose again to save and to empower. I pray that this, uh, this time we spent together would be helpful uh, to the folks who've listened to God, that it would encourage them in their faith and their ministry. And that uh, we do pray for our world, God, as we're in the midst of this uh, pandemic, we pray for your healing, your comfort, your protection, uh, God, your boldness, that the, the church of Jesus Christ would rise up and be the salt uh, of the earth, the light of the world and point people to you in your name, Jesus, we pray these things and for the sake of your kingdom. Amen. Again, Nate and Ryan, thank you for this wonderful webinar and the content you provided. And to everyone uh, that was able to attend, we appreciate your support for th this, uh, this process of resourcing and uh, look for more uh, webinars on different topics down the road. Thank you all and have a good day. Bye-bye. Peace out. Thank you. God bless.